Okay, so welcome to this next video on bacterial persistence. So, so far we have seen how uh, if you expose a bacterial colony of E. coli uh, to uh, penicillin antibiotics such as ampicillin, then uh, it will reduce the population hugely, but it won't reduce it to zero. And the reason it won't reduce it to zero is that some of these bacteria are not sensitive to penicillin, and these are called the persisters. And the reason they're not responding to the penicillin is because they are not dividing and penicillin is only really effective at killing bacteria if they are dividing because uh, if the bacterium is not dividing then it already has a viable cell wall uh, which is functioning perfectly well and preventing osmotic lysis so blocking the peptidoglycan transpeptidase enzyme isn't going to affect the ones that aren't dividing Whereas the ones which are dividing, effectively, this crude cartoon here demonstrates the essential principle that, you know, when you divide the cell in two, the cell wall has to divide in two as well. So you're going to need a huge amount of new cell wall to be synthesized. So you go through the process of synthesizing the peptidoglycan polymers, which are these just strands, but that's not what you need. That's not the whole cell wall. The cell wall has to um, be a rigid mesh. And in order to create that, you have to cross-think the peptidoglycan strands to actually create something that's strong and rigid. Uh, and peptidoglycan transpeptidase, or penicillin binding protein, is the enzyme which produces those cross-thinks. And if you inhibit it, you're not going to get a strong cell wall being produced here. Water is going to move into the cells through uh, osmosis and is going to cause osmotic lysis and death of those two daughter cells. So it kills the cells which are dividing and not the ones which aren't dividing. So in this video, what we want to do is look at the mechanism by which those uh, persisters actually stop themselves from dividing. And basically, if we draw our E. coli bacterium here, Let's say this is a persister, then what this persister has done is it has, what we've noted is that it has very, very high levels of something known as PPPGPP, which stands for guanosine, uh, a guanosine um, um, uh, nucleotide, that's the word, or nucleoside maybe, uh, with these five phosphate groups attached to it. So let me just outline what that is in a cartoon. So, uh, first the guanosine then. Uh, the, the guanosine has a ribose sugar here. So I'll just draw it in cartoon, which so will represent the ribose sugar as um, just a pentagon. And then off the sec, well, well actually off the first carbon of the, uh, uh, of the ribose sugar, because this entry up here is an oxygen. Um, you have the organic base guanine, so we'll draw that as a box. So, okay, there's guanine. And now, off this uh, fourth carbon here, you have a fifth carbon coming up here. So, overall, that now is the structure of guanosine, which is a, what's known as a nucleoside. Okay, and I'll explain to you what the difference between a nucleoside and a nucleotide is. A nucleoside is just an organic base, such as guanine, uh, which is used in um, DNA, so this is an organic base, uh, and uh, bonded to a ribose sugar, organic base. And it's bonded, it needs to be bonded to a ribose here. Now, ribose is not the sugar used in DNA. It's the sugar used in RNA. The sugar used in DNA is deoxyribose. So in fact, uh, in DNA, you don't have nucleotides or nucleosides. You have deoxynucleosides and deoxynucleotides um, because it's got deoxyribose rather than normal ribose. Okay, so to convert a, a nucleoside, which is a ribose sugar with an organic base, into a nucleotide, uh, which is the word that people are more commonly uh, familiar with, what you need to do is add on a phosphate group to this uh, fifth carbon up here, which I'll draw as a ball. So now, if you have an organic base with a ribose sugar with a phosphate, that is what is known as a nucleotide. Okay, right. And again, uh, nucleotides are really what are used in RNA. Strictly speaking, what's used in DNA is deoxynucleotides rather than, uh, rather than nucleotides. Because as I say, nucleotides are made with ribose, and deoxynucleotides would then be made with deoxyribose, which is the sugar you use in DNA. Right, okay, so when I write uh, PPP, 
uh, GPP, what that means is um, a guanosine nucleoside, so guanine with the ribose sugar here makes guanosine, and then with two, well, two phosphate groups off this third um, uh, carbon down here, so two phosphate groups coming off down here, like so, so here are two phosphate groups, and I'll colour them in. So two more phosphate groups coming off the hydroxyl group of the uh, third carbon of the ribose sugar. And then you have three phosphate groups coming off this fifth carbon, which is up here. And I should emphasize that that is a carbon that I've drawn at that corner there. Okay. And we've drawn the ready drawn one, so we'll need just two more. So I'll make them have to make them a little bit smaller so that they will fit in. Uh, but there are the um, two more phosphate groups added onto there. And that's the structure of PPPGPP. Okay, so the level of this molecule in the E. coli cytoplasm appears to go up. Okay, and what does this molecule do? Well, it inhibits an enzyme, basically. So this molecule comes along and it binds to and inhibits an enzyme which is called exopolyphosphatase, uh, which is often abbreviated to PPX. Okay, so this is exopolyphosphatase. Okay, and the role of the enzyme exopolyphosphatase is to break down uh, polyphosphates. Okay, now what is a polyphosphate? Well, polyphosphate is basically just phosphate groups, well, not esterified, um, polymerized with each other. So let me show you one. So basically, it's just a phosphate group bonded to a phosphate group, bonded to a phosphate group, bonded to a phosphate group, bonded to another phosphate group, bonded to another, etc., etc. And it goes on and on, basically. That is what is meant by a polyphosphate. Okay, so let me color all these phosphates in pink again. So these are all phosphate groups. Okay, so this is a uh, polyphosphate molecule. Okay, and what it means uh, for it to be an exopolyphosphatase is it means that it's going to break down these polyphosphates, and it's going to, the way it's going to break down is if I draw another terminal phosphate here, so th let's say this is the last phosphate on this side of the polyphosphate molecule, the way it's going to break it down is from the outside, that's why this exo comes here. It means basically that it's going to go right to the end of the polyphosphate and chop off the terminal phosphate, and then once that one's gone, it will then chop off the next one, and then the next one after that, etc. It does not uh, just come to the middle of the enzyme and chop there. That would be an endopolyphosphatase, and I should have. This should be an exopolyphosphatase. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, if this enzyme is inhibited by the, the the rising level of PPP GPP, then this enzyme's activity goes down. Now, this enzyme breaks down the polyphosphates. So, if the level of this enzyme goes down, uh, or the level of the activity of this enzyme goes down, the polyphosphate level within the cytoplasm goes up. So overall, what we can now couple is we can couple a rise in the level of PPP, GPP, to a rise in the level of polyphosphates. And right, now um, polyphosphates activate another enzyme in the cytoplasm. Okay, so this enzyme is known as LON protease. Okay, so this is LON protease. Let me just label this one up. So this is LON protease. So the rising levels in polyphosphates in the cytoplasm leads to LON protease becoming active. And now what LON protease does is it breaks down uh, certain molecules in E. coli known as antitoxins. So E. coli has basically 11 antitoxins. Um, in its cytoplasm. And these are basically antidotes to uh, toxins which it produces. Okay, so E. coli produces a bunch of toxins, and to spare itself from these toxins, it basically makes antitoxins. Now, long protease is going to break down these antitoxins. So if you break down the antitoxins and you still have the toxins, so let's say this is the toxin over here, 
then what's going to happen is the toxin level within the E. coli cytoplasm is going to go up, and the effect of these toxins is to stop protein synthesis. So these stop uh, protein synthesis. Okay, where should I? Well, they, they're going to stop protein synthesis. Okay, and if you stop protein synthesis, then you cannot divide, because in order to divide the cell, uh, what you need to basically double the amount of protein you have. And if you can't double the amount of protein, protein you have, because protein synthesis in, is inhibited by these toxins that E. coli produces, uh, then um, you're going to not divide. And that's how these bacteria become persisters. Basically, what they do is they activate mechanisms that lead to the toxins which they produce acting on themselves. That's how they become persisters. And let me just go over the mechanism again. So the level of this uh, PPP, GPP goes up. That causes the level of polyphosphates to go up by inhibiting the enzyme which breaks down polyphos uh, polyphosphates, this enzyme exopolyphosphatase. Polyphosphates activate an ends a protease known as LON protease. LON protease destroys these 11 antitoxins that the E. coli makes in order to neutralize the toxins which it makes, which are meant to be secreted and uh, attack other, um, other bacteria. But um, if, um, if it, basically, in order to spare the E. coli from its own toxins, usually it has these 11 antitoxins. But if it breaks those 11 antitoxins down, it's going to be exposed to its own toxins. And when it is exposed to its own toxins, they inhibit its protein synthesis. So uh, it can no longer divide. That produces... Uh, bacteria stasis, and the cells therefore no longer are susceptible to penicillin because only bacteria which are dividing are really um, sensitive to penicillin. So that's um, a mechanism by which E. coli can turn on um, persistence.